Hello and welcome back to the Evolution of Horror. My name is Mike and, as ever, I am your host. If you're tuning in for the first time, then welcome. Usually, on this podcast, we explore the history and the evolution of the horror genre by looking at particular sub-genres across series of weeks. However, a couple of months ago, we finished our series on the evolution of the zombie movie, a 23-episode series in which we covered every single zombie movie from White Zombie in 1931 all the way through to Train to Busan and One Cut of the Dead. Uh, And in the autumn, we are going to be starting a brand new series in which we explore the world of the occult in horror. That's going to be movies concerning themselves with Satanism and witchcraft and the dark arts. Cannot wait. So right now we're in a little break between series, but I couldn't resist this opportunity to bring you a bonus episode because this month saw the re-release of one of the most beloved horror classics of all time, Don't Look Now. Now, Don't Look Now has not yet been covered in depth on this podcast, and actually I got quite a lot of feedback after we did our ghost series uh, from people saying, why didn't you include Don't Look Now? And you're absolutely right, in in some ways I never really thought of Don't Look Now as a ghost story, but of course it is, I mean, where else would it go? So I'm trying to write that wrong now, and this seems like the perfect time to do it because the film is out in cinemas and it's also getting a beautiful 4K Blu-ray re-release. Uh, so this week we're going to be bringing you an in-depth, spoilerific discussion of Don't Look Now. We will be giving away all of the major plot elements from the start of this conversation, so be warned. If you haven't seen Don't Look Now, please do seek it out before you listen to our conversation because this movie is all about the surprises. Uh, Before I introduce my guest, who I'm very, very excited about, I've got another piece of exciting news. Now, we have actually got some Don't Look Now goodies to give away. Uh, We have got a couple of beautiful uh, pieces of Don't Look Now artwork. We've got a couple of postcards, and we've also got some posters, some A3 posters of the movie to give away, and a couple of copies of the Blu-ray, the new 4K restoration. Uh, So, if you want to get your hands on any of these things, then you need to enter our competition. Uh, You just need to email in and answer one question, and here it is. At some point in this week's discussion, my guest reveals what the scariest moment in his scariest movie he's ever seen is. The scariest moment of his scariest movie. At some point in our discussion, he reveals what that is. All I want you to do is listen out for that And as soon as you spot it, email evolutionofhorror at gmail.com and tell me what it was he said. That's evolutionofhorror at gmail.com. The winners will be selected at random and the competition closes in exactly one week's time at midnight on Monday the 29th of July. So one more time, email in what is Brett's scariest moment from his scariest horror movie. Email evolutionofhorror at gmail.com with your answers. Okay, so let's get into it then. So uh, I was joined by a very, very special guest to discuss Don't Look Now. He is an actor, a comedian, a writer, a filmmaker, a director, and he also happens to host one of my favourite podcasts, The Brilliant Films to be Buried With. That's right, I was joined by none other than Brett Goldstein. He sat down to talk to me about one of his favourite movies of all time, Don't Look Now. Here we go. Okay, welcome Brett Goldstein. Hello. Hello, how are you? I am very good. Thank you so much for being here, Brett. Thank you for having me. I've been uh, riding across London (laughs) listening to your podcast, listening to your voice. I feel terrible. London traffic has been horrendous today and you've you've actually got on a bike to be here. It was like planes, trains and automobiles to get here. (laughs) And uh, and, uh, it was totally worth it. Very grateful. Thank you for having me. No, no problem at all. Uh, I'm a huge fan of yours and of your podcast, so it's a real honour to have you here. Uh, Just for people, you know, I'm sure a lot of listeners of this podcast are aware of your podcast, but for anyone who isn't, just let us yeah. know like tell me a little bit about your podcast uh, the podcast is called films to be buried with and the idea is that each week i have a guest uh, and they are usually someone f- famous uh, mm. <laughs> and they the, i tell them they've died they get to pick how they die and then uh we discuss the films that meant the most to them through their life so i ask them What's the film that made you cry the most? What's the film that scared you the most? What's the first film you saw, etc. Love it. And then uh, they have to pick a film that they're going to 
take with them to the other side. So good. Almost almost like a desert island discs of films. Well, I'll tell you the secret of it, but don't tell anyone. (laughs) It's not really. It's not entirely about the films. (laughs) Like people end up telling you stuff because they're talking about films. What they're really telling you about is their childhood. or Yeah, exactly. It's just a great one on one interview, basically. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. I don't tell them that because then they'd, (laughs) they'd... they'd get all uh, shy <laughs> but it's i think it's a really fascinating way about finding out uh, about people's lives and stuff as well because really you know films are the thing markers of your life they I really are they really yeah. are you learn a lot about people i think through their films yeah uh, their film tastes how did you how did it kind of kick off how did that idea come about for the podcast i had the idea for ages and i don't know i don't know i just uh i wish i'd done it sooner actually in hindsight because i think i've had the idea for a few years mm-hmm. and then just one day i don't know what happened i just thought oh fucking hell, i'm not getting any younger shall i try it yeah. and then it sort of seemed to touch wood work it's done amazingly well yeah, yeah and the beauty nice. of podcasts is that you can just go like well oh, fuck it i'll just make it yeah then, yeah know, yeah which is quite nice. yeah it's like i'll do three and if it doesn't work no one saw yeah. <laughs> so it's fine exactly exactly yeah. that's brilliant so we are predominantly going to talk about the horror genre on this podcast. Yes. And I've heard you talk about horror and you've had people like Andy Nyman and Ke- yeah. Mark Kermode, obviously, on your podcast. Uh, tell me a little bit about your relationship with the horror genre. Has it always been something that you've been keen on? Are you not so keen? What's your relationship with uh, it? I love it. I love it. But I don't. There are things I don't like. Yeah. There are types of horror I don't like. And they basically come down to people being hurt <laughs> right okay i'm not Interesting. into people being hurt films mm-hmm. like your hostel type yeah. thing i mean hostel i'm not into in any way but as yeah. in that type of what genre is that yeah um, i guess people call it people torture call it porn. yeah i'm definitely not into torture porn yeah i really find it sort of i don't i don't think i get it in the way that i get the other type i just find it really unpleasant and i'm like what what is it you're getting out of this yeah. i'm not sure uh but i love Having said all that, I think about films like uh, The Descent, which mm. I love, and it's very satisfying so when satisfying. when they're smashing each, <laughs> each other to bits. Like I get that because there's a catharsis, I think, in yeah. the in the fight back. But I don't. I just don't think I like seeing long long scenes of people being tortured. It's just not my thing. Yeah, I agree with you, and I think it's a for me. It's about suspense and fear and yeah. tension, and there's so much of that in the descent. It feels like when you get to the the violent stuff in the descent, it's earned, it's earned it. it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's Whereas tor- yeah, torture porn, it's like that's all you get. There is no yeah. suspense. There is no excitement to it. Yeah, it's interesting. When was your first? Do you remember your first ever horror film, or how old you were? What that situation yeah. was? Well, because uh, there's two there's two things I was thinking about. One is that I I, I remember like uh, my friend Coral uh, when I was maybe like six or seven that we had like a pajama a party and we watched we had films to watch and they were like i think it was like greece 2 annie and carrie amazing amazing and, uh, <laughs> what a uh, lineup that's and amazing i think uh, i think i half fell asleep uh <laughs> before carrie so carrie was on and then i woke up and carrie was happening and i was fucking terrified and then when the <laughs> hand comes up i think we both were like whoa god jesus yeah uh and that scared me for a long time but the thing i always think i think what probably tipped me into it is twin peaks oh. is I'm obsessed with David Lynch and basically whenever I was, I'm sure I've talked about this, but I do think this is like a defining moment in my life is that me and my sister came home from somewhere and we were really young and my dad was watching TV and we said, hello. And he went, shush, 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 sit down. And it was the very beginning of Twin Peaks, the first episode. Oh my God. And we were very young. Yeah. And we watched this fucking pilot and we were so scared, but so hooked on it Mm. that then... I think I just moved out into my own bedroom, not moved out of home, but moved, like had a separate bedroom to my sister. Yeah. And I was, we were so scared, I dragged my mattress <laughs> back into her room and slept by her bed. And then we watched all of Twin Peaks. Oh my and God. I reckon that was the thing that, yeah that got me it's incredible isn't it david lynch we talked about david lynch a fair bit on this because it's it, it, where do you kind of place him it, are, are any of his things really horror but th- he he sort of conjures up the most frightening nightmarish yeah. images more than any uh, actually funnily enough nick rogue i think as, as well in don't look yeah. now which we'll talk about but there's something about those images in in twin peaks and stuff like that it just yeah. gets you doesn't it i think he's the scariest actually because yeah, i also I remember because once i got obsessed with him and i watched everything i remember watching a razor head and i watched it like with headphones on a TV because oh that's all God. I could get and I remember like running downstairs to my sister 
and going, I'm so fucking scared. And she said, why? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's it. That's it's like, exactly it. I don't know why that's so scary because I can't explain it to you. But. Why is this getting to me? Why is this man, Bob, like sort of walking from the back of frame yeah. towards the oh, camera? Okay, so no. frightening, but it yeah. really is, isn't it? It's the stuff of nightmares. Uh, amazing. Have you seen uh, Midsummer yet, by the way? I have. What I did you think? It. Did you? Love nice. Because that's really divided people, hasn't it? But Well, yeah. I can understand that. It's yeah. a... It's a well i just i also love anything like that where it's like a mad art film that is in the multiplexes in the summer it's like incredible that it even exists yeah i'm sure i've said this on my podcast but hereditary (laughs) genuinely was like a break point like as in it broke me as in (laughs) i was like i don't think i can watch a horror for a while (laughs) it scared me so much yeah that I actually was like, maybe I don't like horror. <laughs> like it wasn't, I was yeah. fucked by it. Yeah, there is a, there's a different type of scare, I think, isn't there? And again, yeah. I think we could talk about this with Don't Look Now. There is a kind of unsafe scare with things like hereditary where yeah. it's like i genuinely don't want to be sitting here anymore as yeah. opposed to just your fun kind of slasher movie or something like it that. was all the people in the ceilings in the corners oh. of the ceiling that was fucking me up and then i started to think well i can't be in a place that has a ceiling anymore so yeah. now i've got to live in a cylindrical yeah. tent forever <laughs> forever it's the only solution <laughs> yeah uh, and it's interesting you're a comedian as well and yeah. i always think comedy and horror yeah they both get kind of lumped together in this kind of i don't know sometimes there's a there's a certain amount of sniffiness about those two genres in particular do you find i mean why do you think that is in your opinion why are those two sort of never eligible for awards and that kind of thing uh i think it is to do with uh body shame Mm. i think it is the same reason that people uh don't respect uh (laughs) this is a mad thing to say but i've been thinking about this i saw this (laughs) document oh my god you might cut this we'll see how it goes i can't wait you see those documentaries like After Porn Ends yes. and uh, and how badly ex-porn stars are treated by everyone, yeah. by their families, by colleagues, by the world seemingly. And I think it's all part of the same thing, which is people are embarrassed or ashamed of their own involuntary uh, reflexes. And so yeah. a comedy makes you laugh. If a comedy makes you laugh, there's nothing you can do about it. And if a horror makes you jump, there's nothing you can do about mm. it. And critical analysis doesn't apply because you can say, well, I didn't like it. Didn't what you can say, well, you fucking jumped. Yeah. You, you, it did work. You can say you didn't, you know, you can say all you want, but it did work and you did laugh. Yeah. And in a porn film, you did have, yeah, you were Feelings. aroused. Yeah. You exactly. were aroused. And, Porn comedy and horror. It's so true. Does that make sense? Or is absolutely, this a mad You're thought? absolutely right. They evoke v- physical reactions out of us. Yeah, and people are ashamed of having, I guess, animal animal natures or, yeah. or, or uncontrollable reactions. Yeah. And so they're kind of look down upon mm. does that make sense yeah, absolutely makes sense because okay. actually even if you think of within horror there are like for example critics like kermode and actually loads of horror fans too loads of us are w- might kind of turn our noses up a bit at the kind of james one ghost train type movies yeah. like the conjuring that they are the best at jump scares out yeah, of every I think, film <laughs> i think the conjuring 2 is a masterpiece right and, a, and of a ghost train it's like it's such a, ghost train. a good ghost train and I find myself sometimes watching those movies and I do get angry by it because I'm like, for fuck's sake, I know you're going to get me yeah. and it still gets me. I jump out of my skin every time with movies like Annabelle and the Country yeah. and those types of movies. Yeah, so that's so true, I think. It is, it's like there's, there's some weird, sordid shame in getting a sort of visceral reaction. Yeah, yeah. and it's, it's the same why people don't, uh, critics don't like weepies. Like yes. they'll go like, oh, it's so manipulative and stuff. And you go, right. yeah, because you cried. Yeah. And you're ashamed of yourself it's for so having true. feelings. You only, you know, critically, they like stuff that's not affecting their bodies. Yeah. So they yeah. can just go, yeah, no, it was very good. Actually. Yeah. I thought about stuff. Uh, you know, I think there is a, a fine line between comedy and horror. And I think comedy often has quite a lot of darkness in it as well. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, so there is that sort of weird connection, I would say. I think comedy completely comes from a dark place. Do I? Yeah, I think I do. <laughs> I think it, I think it yeah. can do, can't it? Definitely. Yeah. And equally, yeah, Midsummer is a very funny movie as well. Very funny. But we're here today to talk about the amazing Don't Look Now yes. um, from 1973. So this movie uh, has just had a re-release. Very excitingly, it's just it's it's been it's out in cinemas currently, uh, and lovely 4K restoration of it, and it's coming out on Blu-ray later on in the month. We're going to get into it. We're going to go sort of full spoilery with this from the start because it's an old movie, and yeah. hopefully, if you're listening to this, you've seen the film. If 
if you've not seen the film, can you pause this and then watch the film? Yeah. And then listen, because it is the, it's in my top three of all time. I think this is one of the greatest films of all time. Amazing. <laughs> She does not come peeping with messages back from behind the grave. Yes. Christine is dead. Yes. She is dead. Yes. Dead, 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 dead. Uh, Don't It Now opens uh, with a very, very upsetting scene. Uh, There's a family in their house. Uh, Husband and wife are in the house. Two kids are outside playing. And the daughter uh, drops a ball into the pond outside and the father inside suddenly stands up uh, and rushes outside and the daughter has drowned in the pond. Mm. And then we cut to, I believe it's about six months later, and uh, the husband and wife are in Venice. The husband is restoring uh, a church in Venice. He's working there. And so they've sort of moved out there to try and escape their grief, as it were. And while they're out there... They're having lunch one day and a blind woman and her sister uh, sort of make contact with them in this restaurant. And they say to the wife, I've seen your daughter. She was stood between you and she was laughing. She wants you to know she's fine. Mm. And that's the setup. That's a good setup. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you've, you've, you've already sort of covered this, but I, my first question for you was going to be, are you a fan of this film? Do you like I it? I think it's magnificent (laughs) and every time i watch it it's i think it's just uh, there's a question i do in my podcast which is what do you think is objectively the greatest film of all time not necessarily your favorite but what is the pinnacle of cinema aliens come and they go what what is cinema i would say don't look now in what it does with film and edit and sound and uh, color and acting i mean where do I start? I know. Where do you start? <laughs> well, we'll go through it all. But it's okay. very, yeah, it's an incredible movie. Do you remember the, your sort of first time yes, watching this movie? I watched it. I can't remember how old I was. Maybe like 15 or something. And the ending scared me so much. <laughs> and I remember my friend Tim Glencross. I grabbed him and made him just watch the ending. And <laughs> it fucked him up for life. And, but the, uh, I, I suppose the first time I saw it, I don't know how much I took from it other than i loved it and it was really scary that's what i thought of it the first time but then the the next time i've now seen it a lot of times yeah and the more i watch it the more i think it's such a beautiful my main reason for loving don't look now is i think it is the best portrait of a marriage ever in cinema 100 percent. i can't you're so right and i think that more and more the more i watch it as well uh i I had a kind of different reaction, weirdly. I think the first time I saw it as a teenager, and I think at the time I was very much like, yeah, I just like proper kind of scary, Mm. nasty horror movies. And obviously I'd heard so much about this and it's one of the most, you know, sort of infamously scary movies. And I was a little bit like, oh, is this, it's it's almost just a drama for the the bulk of it. Uh, But it has been a movie that the more I've watched it, the more I have loved it and loved it and loved it. And this most, I watched it the other night before we did this chat and I was like, fuck, it is. Like you say, it's, it's, it's per- it's almost a perfect movie. Yeah. I think it's perfectly made from start to finish. Sort of every element works. Yeah, I mean, there's so much. Uh, I don't. Well, I was going to say I don't want to bore you, but I guess this please, is what the this is, is why you're here. Please. Well, firstly, <laughs> should we start with the the acting. Yeah, yeah. Please Fuck do tell me, me yeah. in the face that acting. Yeah. From Donald Sutherland and Julie Christie, who, by the way, are not married no. in real life, and I don't think had met much. I've never seen a more convincing couple. Yeah. And there's something so unbelievably natural about them. And I was watching, there's a moment in the restaurant where he's uh, fiddling with something and she's just looking at him. And it's so unselfconscious, both of them. Yeah. In a way that I cannot compare to any other performance. Unselfconscious is a perfect word yeah. to describe it, I think. This whole obviously we'll, we'll talk about the sex scene it's so famous for its sex well, scene well i've got a lot to say about yeah, it we've got a lot to say about that <laughs> but even the moments leading up to it like 
when he's kind of like stood in the bathroom feeling his love mm. handles and I don't know there's something about it that almost feels like we're we're watching something we're not supposed to be watching it's like you're looking in on a real there's real couple like you say there's a thing about uh, like nudity in cinema and I I, t- I, I like it's complicated and sometimes you watch films where like particularly there's a woman naked and you think yeah. does she need to be naked is yeah. this exploitative and all this and quite often you watch something and go no one needed to be naked in this way totally. but in Don't Look Now they're both completely naked and it feels so real there yeah. is no part of it that feels cheap or or I don't know uh, gratuitous it's yeah. like this is a married couple she's in the bath he's brushing his teeth yeah. like Donald Sutherland are you a fan of his in general I mean he's been in yeah. some other incredible works right he's great I'll tell you something I know about him mm. uh, that is interesting maybe you know this is that apparently I don't know if he still has this because I don't know what how much I, I, I hope he does mm. but when he was at his prime and he was a star and could command anything one of his contractual rules was what in his driver was if i do your film we start filming from the middle huh. because in his head it might take me a while to get into character if we film the first scenes first the audience will notice but if we film the middle scenes first by the time we get to the middle scenes they'll <sighs> they'll have forgotten oh. they'll, they'll be in you know what i mean that so great. is and Makes i suppose sense. particularly for a film like this where the first scene's so important yeah. right yeah that's really interesting wow he's amazing he absolutely yeah. and there, like you said there is something about them the two of them that's just like it's unshowy it's unglamorous the, it is the, the awful scene of him pulling his daughter out of the pond like it's also like the way he portrays that anguish is so upsetting and also so uh there's something about it that's very I don't know how to this might sound weird but I mean like unvain mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. it's it's yep. it's, yeah, it's an kind of ugly yeah. scene and he's making <sighs> odd noises <sighs> 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 I have a friend who's an actor, I won't name them, and they are famous for, they're very good at crying, they're very good at crying, they do a lot of crying scenes, and then they lost someone very close to them in their family, and they told me that, like, they went back to work and they were expected to do these crying stuff, and that she suddenly felt like, this isn't actually realistic, now she'd gone through grief, she was like, it doesn't sound like this, it doesn't look like this, I've been doing this for years and it's what people expect on TV, but suddenly it feels... It's film crying. Yeah, Yeah, yeah. And I think the way... Both of them are in it is not film. Yes, he's film not acting. film anguished. Yeah, you're so right. John, Christine is still with us. Christine is dead, Laura. No. Christine is dead. Of course, of course. I know, but you know that the, the two ladies in the restaurant, well, they were watching us while we were eating. They kept staring as they told me this because they could see sitting between us, they could see christine sitting between us this is two people who we don't even know this listen listen now that their marriage that i think in film you usually see either a sort of happily ever after perfect couple or you see a couple breaking up and uh, hating it you often see married couples that hate each other yeah i think you see them more than any other yeah and if it's a serious film it's usually oh this marriage is awful yeah and i think what you see in Daniel now is a really good marriage yeah that has been put under a terrible strain and he and the, the their negative sides of that marriage are totally f- fair. Yeah, <laughs> and right, like right. He, yeah. You know, he's slight. I think he's slightly frustrated by her. Well, this thing that she's attracted to these two women who are, he doesn't want to talk about stuff. Yeah, and she does, and and I think he gets frustrated with her, but it doesn't make me not like mm-hmm. him. It just you're sort of like. You want him to come round to her, yeah, you do. To her point of view, but but I don't. For me, I I never dislike either of them. I think they're great. Yeah, yeah. No, fair, fair. Yeah. I think I feel, I feel the same way. What do you? Feel, what about the son though? I feel bad for the yeah, son. The son does. <laughs> the only character that gets a bad deal is the son. I, I do think the film deliberately maybe makes us question: Are they good parents? Were yes. they neglectful parents? Is it their fault? Is it not? And also the way that they've treated the son throughout the film yeah obviously they're going through a lot and it's understandable but yeah i wonder if that's there is also a little bit of that tension well that is something i thought because i watched it again recently and i thought they the son is at boarding school they send the son off to boarding school in venice and i just thought when i was watching it i was like is this just a product of its time like yeah. they yeah 
they I, I i couldn't work out i don't don't know the answer to this whether it's like a deliberate point that the film is making they've sent their son to boarding yeah. schools that can't cope or it's like in 1973 a couple like this automatically would have had children in boarding school i yeah. don't know the answer yeah. yeah i hope it's the latter yeah yeah rather than they were like get out of the way <laughs> we need some space we like the girl <laughs> <laughs> i know i did think i do keep thinking every time i watch it I'm like oh that poor kid yeah. and then there's that whole storyline where he burns himself yeah. and stuff but like, she oh, rushes God. straight to his she side. does rush straight to his side yeah. it's very true um let's just go back to the beginning then briefly right. and talk about that opening scene as well i think it's probably the most famous maybe apart from the end scene the yeah. most one of the most famous moments in the film um what what is it about this this scene? I mean, obviously, it's an, an extremely horrible thing that happens, but it's also, like you say, it's the performance and it's also the way it's directed. What is it about this scene that's so powerful? Well, it's because you're cutting... It's also setting up this thing of... The film is about time yeah. and memory and what the biggest spoiler of all is, it's basically what Arrival is, what the film Arrival is. Yes. Don't Look Now. Arrival is a remake of Don't Look Now with Aliens, I think. Oh my God, you're so right. Yeah, because it's about... Time is a circle, time is a mosaic, time is not linear. And also there's that loss of a child, spoiler yeah. alert. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 so true. And uh, he, and so the beginning is slightly, there's something inherently kind of scary the way the beginning is edited because mm-hmm. it sort of seems nice, but it's cut quite quickly and you keep seeing this slide of this red yeah. girl in the church and it cuts to outside and back inside and outside and back inside and you get this sense of, something's going to happen yeah dread it, yeah it's building and I, and it's partly building just by the speed of the cuts i think yeah that you think oh something's gonna happen something's gonna happen yeah and that is his point of view because he has uh the sixth sense or a sense of time yeah beyond the linear right and he uh, he isn't acknowledging it so we are feeling this sort of push and pull of like something's gonna happen and he he's feeling it too but he's ignoring it and then you keep seeing this image of a red hatted girl in in sat in a pew in the church and then he, he knocks something over and water spreads over that red image and Ooh. then suddenly he's like he gets up and she goes what's wrong and he goes nothing and then he suddenly is running outside yeah it is and it's 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 kind of mundane in certain ways yeah, yeah. he spills a bit of liquid on a slide but yeah. there is something about it that makes your heart go f- oh you know you think oh fuck at that moment it is but it's you, in the same way as david lynch i think like we discussed there's this weird feeling of oh i'm suddenly feeling extreme amounts of dread and i don't know why yeah yeah you know? Uh, and, and this is probably a good chance to talk about Nick Rogue then as a director because it's so what much. A oh, what a guy! What a guy! Um, are you a fan of his in general? Yes. Other than this movie, mm. yes. I mean, he's one of the greats, right? I mean, he's uh, he's on my list of. He's got the five perfect five. He's got perfect five films. He's on the Rob Reiner, uh, John Landis, <laughs> Nicholas Rogue, David Lynch. Five masterpieces, each, five masterpieces each. Is that right? I thought that about that list? it. Yeah, I I did, so. I've not heard of this list. Is this a legit list? I might have made it up. But I like it. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. like it. It's good. Rob Reiner, amazing. <laughs> Rob Reiner, most underrated director of all time. Yeah, you're probably right. That's Look amazing. That. Look at that list. Yeah. Spinal Tap. Harry Met Stand Sally. by Me. Harry Met Sally. Misery. Oh my North. god. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's the other Stand one? Stand by Me. No, we've said we Stand, said by, me. Stand by, me. by Me. Misery. This is Spinal Tap. When Harry Met Sally. Princess Bride. Oh, come off it! Oh my God, he's going so straight right. to heaven. He's going, he's going straight to heaven. <laughs> Fucking hell! Yeah. Well, yeah, Nick Rogue. It's the, yeah, absolutely. You can you can list them, can't you? Obviously, Walk About and some of those early ones. The Man Who Fell to Earth. Man Who Fell to Earth. Performance. <sighs> Castaway. Castaway. Oh my God! Don't look now. I mean, the film that scared me the most as a child, actually, The Witches as well. Roald the Witches. The Witches. He's got six. There is something about The Witches yeah. as well, which is uh, incredibly frightening and weird you don't see many kids movies like that as well do you just the way that's shot and edited um yeah i think there is something like people bandy around the term uh pure cinema a lot but i think it applies so much to don't look now because i think that even if you didn't understand the dialogue even if it was a foreign language i think and and you there were no subtitles i think just from like images and editing and sound you get what you're supposed to get from it almost that's yeah. the the weird thing it just he tells a story visually and cinematically that's the other thing i was thinking about that beginning it's right there from the beginning the whole film feels mm. lived in mm-hmm. that's why their performances it's like you don't even in that very first scene when he's looking at slides and she's yeah. looking through a reference book for yeah. christine you go like 
this feels like they've been in that house for yes. years and when they're in Venice every part of it feels completely lived in and there's no it makes you catch up in a way that I always like it doesn't go oh we're now moving to Venice to do it like it's all happening and you're just okay you're working out as it goes along because they've been lived living in that it's just all lived in. Totally. Very... You're right. And actually, while we're talking about, while you're talking about the kind of the non-linear, you know, the, the, the reveal, I suppose, in that it is this kind of like weird, timeless kind of non-linear narrative type yeah. structure where you've got obviously this character who has a sixth sense and the way the story's being told. Uh, is it important? That, did, I mean, did you get that on first watch? Did you get it from the end even that the reveal is like, ah, this is what's been happening? And and yeah. is that important to the to enjoying the film? Well, uh i think it, yes <laughs> well as in i think if you don't get that then then you know i've i've had a couple of people say well, i went to see that film you love it's shit and it made me so angry <laughs> and word. i sort of wanted to go i mean it's, you can't did really you understand say it. It. did you understand <laughs> sort of what i wanted to say was did you understand it or did you think it was just a mad yeah. scary thing at the end out of nowhere like mm. yeah because then then yeah of course it's a uh, not a great film yeah but then i think you could Again, you know, I I wouldn't say I could completely understand Lost Highway, but I still love it. Yeah. I don't know if you necessarily need to always be able to piece it together. But it's interesting because this yeah. is a Daphne du Maurier book and, yeah. and I associate that with, you know, Hitchcock, The Birds and Rebecca and these kind of more classic thrillers yeah. or mysteries. And again, this is not that. You, you might be surprised if you go into this thinking it's a Daphne du Maurier yeah. thriller. Yeah, it's I read the story. Oh, did you? Yeah, and it's interesting. It's very, very close, very mm-hmm. close. Uh, and the last line of the book is him after what happens and he goes oh what a bloody stupid way to die that's wow the last line of it. fantastic yeah that's great because again you it's so it's so much a film it's really hard to yeah. imagine it as a book i yeah. haven't read it but yeah it's really interesting um yeah so i mean incredibly powerful opening scene you get that uh at like sort of piercing scream from Julie Christie yeah. and then it just cuts straight to that kind of drill, drill yeah. going through a kind of decaying wall and suddenly we're in Venice like you said there's no setup we jump to Venice yeah. we don't really know how much time has passed yeah uh Let's talk about Venice. There. I mean, Venice, obviously, again, it's such a cliche to say the kind of location is so much a character. But again, with this oh, film, really it's is. so much. Of, <laughs> it applies so much. Yeah. Uh, what is important about Venice in this story, do uh, you think? Well, Venice, the reason it's, I think, important to the story is that Venice is a place entirely surrounded by water, which is how their daughter died. And it's also a place that is dying and decaying. The whole yeah. film is about death. Yeah. And, uh, and... I also think the whole film is also about it's about grief and not acknowledging grief I suppose is yeah. that what happens is the husband is consistently ignoring not he's ignoring all of these signs there's this kind of surface story which are people are telling him you should not be here you're in danger you need to go but equally he's ignoring his own grief and his own feelings in sort of putting it on the wife like you're not well and uh I'm fine, but he's not fine. And you know he's not fine because he keeps obsessing over a girl in a red coat that yeah. keeps running about, yeah. knock, knocking about the place. <laughs> <laughs> knocking about the place, yeah. Uh, and it kills him, you know, and his grief, his unacknowledged grief kills him. Mm. And in a place that is entirely made of death. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, Venice is entirely a dying it's, floating dead place it's sinking isn't yeah. it i read a fact that apparently it could be submerged underwater by the end of this century or yeah. something which is sad yeah. uh i watched it with my girlfriend the other day and we've now booked a weekend away to venice oh, i don't know lovely. what that says about the film i don't know if it because no, it doesn't necessarily sell it but there is something about it yeah. i've been before a very long time ago but it's like god it, it is a beautiful place yeah. but also really eerie and those amazing scenes where they're kind of wandering through these kind of streets and alleys at night and it's so empty yeah it's it's almost like it looks like they're filming it on a soundstage or something, yeah. doesn't it? It looks like a set. This is it. It's the Pontecorretto. What? This is it. No, I felt... I've read up on it. They, it was winter and they were in all the non-tourist side of it. You're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it is just this Evil. labyrinth, this dark, quiet, 
yeah. echoey labyrinth. Yeah, and it is like you say. It kind of it's it, the worst place you could possibly go after the drowning of a loved one. Yeah. You go to a, a city that is this labyrinth of water. Yeah, uh, it was about they were doomed from the start, basically. Yeah, but it's also like the I suppose on the nose metaphor that all he, his job is trying to restore a decaying yes. dead thing yes. and that's all he's doing is constantly trying to res- put back what cannot be put back and that's what his whole thing is he can't acknowledge his grief i suppose yeah. does that make sense yeah keep- yeah no you're so right Hello everyone, Mike here, just interrupting this broadcast very briefly to tell you a little bit about what we've got going on on Patreon this week. Now, for those of you who do subscribe to our Patreon channel, I'm sure you know that we've been bringing you new episodes every single week. Last week, I was joined by Stevie Webb and Becky Dark, and we discussed the two classic 80s slashers, A Nightmare on Elm Street Part 2, Freddy's Revenge, what a film, and A Nightmare on Elm Street Part 3, Dream Warriors. Oh yeah. But then the scene when he goes to the bar, oh. the whatever this bar is. In this leather bar. And also, is that a dream sequence? It's not, is no. it? He no. actually is in the bar with the yes. coach and the coach is like, hey, you're coming with me yeah. and bring him back. Do some to laps. <laughs> yeah. And, and but because you think, oh, he's gonna wake up from this, but you know he's gone there. No. And Bob Shea is even in that scene, yes. dressed in a leather waistcoat. Yes. Is he the barman? Yes, he's, he's the barman. barman. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that. That's amazing. It's ridiculous. Yeah. So there you go. If you want to hear a bit more of that magic, if you want to hear our entire hour-long discussion on these movies, you simply need to sign up to our Patreon page. Just go to patreon.com slash evolutionofhorror. And if you can afford to donate $5 per month to help support the costs of making this podcast, you will be you will have access to weekly new episodes and every single other bonus episode that has gone out since the Patreon channel launched. Uh, I've also got another very exciting episode coming towards the end of the week in which... I am going to be counting down and discussing my top 10 horror movies of all time. I had quite a lot of requests from uh, Patreon subscribers and listeners to actually do this, to reveal it. So I thought this week, with the release of Don't Look Now, so many people's favourite horror movie, this is a perfect chance for me to list my favourites and why. So that's going to be this week's Patreon episode. And there's a whole bunch of other exciting stuff coming over the summer, including reviews of Peter Strickland's In Fabric, an in-depth discussion of that, uh, reviews of the Scream sequels, Scream 2, Scream 3, Scream 4, and there may even be an in-depth discussion of the Wicker Man remake with Brad Hansen. Just saying. Uh, So, one more time, if you want to have a listen to any of these bonus episodes and support the podcast, simply go to patreon.com slash evolutionofhorror. And on that note, I want to say a big thank you and do a special shout out to everybody who has donated their hard-earned cash to support the podcast in the last few weeks. So here we go. A big thank you to Troy R., Ben Halton, Kirsty, Alex, Bob Fleck, David John Robert Hawkins, Robbie Dunlop, Elizabeth Brozek, Autumn Beaver, Quinn, Latoya Kell, Claire Baldwin, Alexis Taylor Ackridge, Anne Labs, Sandra Narva, Darren Matthews, Kieran, Stuart Clark, Mardi, Jamie Gordon, Jim Murray, Caitlin Ranney, Kiwi Canavan, Alastair Hasty, David Dilmore, Sam, David Emmett, Christina Westendorf, Edward, Emma, Dill Truslove, Christian Christensen, Emma Lake, Sarah Foster, Brandy Grigg, David Dukes, Travis Trudel, and Sarah Owen. A huge thank you to all of those wonderful, generous people for donating their $5 and subscribing to the Patreon channel. And one more time, if you want to get involved, just go to patreon.com slash evolution of horror. That's patreon.com slash evolution of horror. Okay, let's continue with my chat with Brett Goldstein about the brilliant Don't Look Now. You're sad. You're so sad and there's no need to be. (sighs) My sister's psychic. She wants you to know. I've seen her. And she wants you to know that she's happy. I've seen your little girl sitting between you and your husband and... And she was laughing. We were introduced to those those two old ladies, one of, them, one of which is psychic. They're amazing, aren't they? So and again, good. this kind of weird feeling of like, 
do we trust them? Because they seem so nice at the beginning, but yeah. there's that really eerie moment when we just see them laughing together, yeah. sort of cackling. And then the sister, the one who isn't psychic, kind of seems to become slightly more sinister yeah. in, the, in the second half, doesn't she? It's really weird. What do you make of those two? Uh, well, firstly, I love them, and they're so <laughs> they're so good. They're so yeah. and they're funny in a weird. They're very weird. They are, and uh, I like them a lot. And there's also something I was thinking about in the. The scene that it similarly to what I was saying about like the unvain thing and the not movie version is that when the uh, blind woman who is psychic does her uh, ritual, which is getting in touch with the dead, she's grabbing her breast. She sort of seems to be having an organ. It's a really uncomfortable thing yeah, to watch. Yeah, yeah, and you, yeah. it's almost I can imagine people laughing at it like it's so odd. Yeah, and you almost go, "What? Why is this happening?" Yeah, but I like that because it's like, well, this isn't. Are you are you telling me you know what it is to get in touch with the dead? Right. You know what I mean? Like I like how uh, horror. It's sort of weird and makes you feel like grubby <laughs> yeah no like, totally yeah uh but yeah that she's also what's so great about her is she's funny and really scary yeah at the she same time. told you <laughs> oh my god she told you she told you scary. yeah oh they wait a long time as well to reveal the sister's eyes don't they the yeah. psychic's eyes and there's that again beautifully shot moment when they all run into each other in the toilets yeah. and there's the kind of split mirror sort of shots of yeah. all of them looking at each other and that other poor lady yeah, that, that sort of toilet attendant them, yeah. yeah yeah it is the whole thing is kind of very eerie um and do you think that uh, you know i guess at this point the movie is setting itself up to be a ghost story right i mean is that yes. is this movie a ghost story it's a ghost story yeah yeah, yeah, I, think I guess so. it is because I, you know, the, one of the one of the maybe trickier uh, things about this podcast is that I kind of put things into series of sort of uh, subgenres a lot of the time, and I was thinking, where would you put "Don't Look Now"? And is it is it a ghost story? Do you I think? think it's a ghost story. Yeah, there's no conventional ghosts in it, but I guess well, that's the case with a lot of ghost stories. Yeah, it's a, oh yeah, I think it's a ghost story. Christine's in it, or she's not up to you. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and aren't most ghost stories about grief? exactly way. yeah so they I think are it fits your bill and it's it's got that eeriness that i think a lot of classic old-fashioned ghost stories do almost venice almost looks like a haunted house yeah sometimes, that's the right. way it's shot and all the shadows and everything yeah you know? um so then we get to the then we get to the sex scene so let's let's talk about that sex scene. we've touched upon it briefly these incredible performances and like we mentioned it kind of there's a build-up to it with them just kind of moseying yeah. about and getting in the bath and chatting to each other um it's often considered i think one of the greatest sex scenes ever yeah. in cinema why is. is that Brett I know why I'll tell you what's mad what is mad about it yeah and this is good I mean again I might regret saying this it makes me cry that sex scene right yeah. it's so beautiful and it's again one of the incredibly rare circumstances of uh it's two people making love and it's not a what it is and it's about something it's about they have not had sex since their daughter died mm -hmm. and this is them reconnecting and the reason they are is because the wife has been told uh that her daughter is okay and she, she's taken comfort in that and it's sort of relieved her and then finally they are they are like rejoining each other after this terrible thing and it's so beautiful it's so moving and like again they just seem completely real you just can't believe they're not having sex <laughs> and not in a and again it's like it's just great. And you never see it. You never see a married couple. It's not a first time. It's, it's not so a love. It's true. It's, it's not a kind middle of seduction of their marriage. scene no. or anything. It's the middle of it. It's it's normal marital sex, except it really means something because it's about their emotions in it. And then it's shot in this way. It's edited where, which I think is this whole thing that the film is about, about time and memory, is that you see them getting dressed after it while they're having sex. Yeah. And it keeps cutting back and forth. And it's almost this sense of, I don't know if this is the right word for it, but it's like nostalgia. It's almost yeah. like while they're having sex, they are aware or he is aware that this is such a beautiful moment mm -hmm. that he's already missing it while it's happening. He's already, right. it's already post sex and remembering it fondly and this real moment that they had together and memory and time keep uh, lapping over each other. Like the waters of Venice. Oh, Brett. <laughs> Thank you. Good that night. It's beautiful. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Do you, 
think to ask a bit of a silly question, but yeah. is it sexy? Do you find it sexy? I'm crying and I have a boner. <laughs> At the same time. Yeah. It's a, it's it is, a kroner. It is a kroner. <laughs> yeah. It is a tricky... Because uh, I think you're right. I think it is more moving than it is sexy. I don't... I it's think still, that it's I not... Mean, still, it doesn't feel... They're but still it doesn't, going for it. Yeah, they are still going for it. Uh, and they're both two very attractive people. Yeah. It just doesn't feel like uh, exploitative in any way, does no. it? Like a lot of... Like you mentioned, a lot of sex scenes in movies do. It's not there just to be titillating, no. I suppose. But it feels so real. I, I, I went to a screening the other day with the screenwriter there and he told a story. Uh, he was quite funny because he told lots of like indiscreet stories. And one of the stories he said is that Warren Beatty, who went out with Julie Christie at the time, apparently like broke into the editing suite and like said, you have to take that sex scene out or I'm going to sue everyone or kill everyone <laughs> or something. And I thought, yeah, I can understand that because it feels, it looks so real. Yeah. So natural. Yes. And people thought, didn't they? I think there was a, r- r- people, you know, said there was a lot of hearsay that, that those two actors were really having yeah. penetrative sex during the scene, yeah. which they weren't, but it's just, it was shot in such such a way. Like it, yeah. it fe- again, it's just that feel of authenticity, which yeah. is weird with a movie that is in some ways an art house film. It's, it's mm. like, it, it's got a weird juggling of, of being quite surreal at places, but also being completely real and believable. Yeah. It's like, I don't really know how they manage that. It's magic. <laughs> it is magic. It is. And I heard, as well i don't know if this is true um but i heard that the reason that he he cut it up was because of censorship problems that you know often a lot of these kind of artistic decisions uh, happen yeah. for practical reasons and that uh oh, yeah, showing he... it kind of in its entirety was a problem for the censors and so he just montaged it up with what happened right. afterwards i don't know if that's true but if it is it's kind of in a way even more amazing isn't yeah. it that it just became this thing well he's he i read an interview with him where he he said the whole thing with filmmaking is you have to be he, he i think this is how david lynch is and maybe why they're similar is that he's like you have to the film will take you where the film takes you and you yes. have to be open to it yes and there are things that you you are adamant have to happen and then the location is suddenly not available or an actor drops out or something yeah and he says, and you have to take those things as meaningful and you mm-hmm. should follow them and uh, and you will end up with your the right film because the film tells you where to go. And that would ex- that would answer that. There you go. Film told him. It uh, makes sense. Uh, the film won a BAFTA for Best Cinematography. Uh, it was also n- well nominated done. for a bunch of Oscars. Uh, what do you make? We've touched upon it already, but the cinematography in this, it's got a kind of handheld style a lot yeah. of it as well, hasn't it? I mean, w- yeah. W- how do you think that kind of fits this particular story? Well, there's a, well, the handheld thing is partly it makes it feel natural, but it's also mm. that it, the whole thing's like signs and meaning, like there are signs everywhere. And that, but there's also this sense of almost paranoia. Like there's loads of shots of people watching them when yes. they walk past, and I think that the handheld thing also makes it look like they're being watched. It sort of increases that sense of slight paranoia, like there's something wrong with this yes. place and with us being here because they're constantly being looked at. The cameras following them, yeah. <laughs> literally. Yeah. And uh, and there's a little red coat knocking about. <laughs> <laughs> Just knocking about. Uh, and the editing as well. Uh, yeah. the, the, this montage that we get in the sex scene, it happens a lot throughout the film, this idea of montage. I mean, do you, how do you, it, it's kind of jarring in some ways, I think, yeah. in a good way, don't you think? Like the kind of the editing is, uh, it's a, like a weird mix of kind of like this kind of beautiful, slow dreamlike images and then also kind of weird, tense, dread-filled, jarring images yeah. at the same time. I think it keeps you on your keeps you on on edge the whole time it does and also i always think they didn't have avids back then it must have taken <laughs> fucking ages oh my god to Actually make this slicing, film, slicing stuff this up film up yeah i mean he, he wasn't mucking about i don't know how old fa- how editing used to work back then but what if you sliced and spliced something and then thought that doesn't work actually yeah. we need to reverse that <laughs> you get you sell a tape out yeah. put it back <laughs> exactly yeah that's what i imagine i'm yeah. sure there's a lot more that goes into it no, i think that, that was it yeah Apart from the opening scene, yes. which is powerful and sad, and 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 it's got that kind of suspense element, and then we've talked about some of the drama, we've talked about the kind of slight eeriness of it, we talked about this beautiful sex scene, but it's a horror film, right? Yeah. I mean, do you how 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 scared are you in the traditional horror sense when you watch this film? Uh, I mean, I think it is scary. Uh-huh. It's a scary film. Uh, Why is it scary? Do you think? Uh, well, the 
sisters are scary. It's, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it has the things that horror has, I suppose, in that it's upsetting. Like, you know, yeah. the, the death of the daughter is upsetting The in a similar way to like Ari Aster does, I suppose. Like, right. it's really upsetting. It's yeah. not fun, that bit. Yeah. Uh, but then the sort of ghost story element is uh, the sisters are particularly scary. And what they're suggesting is otherworldly and it puts yeah. you on edge and then the end is i think pretty fucking truly scary. terrifying yeah 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 you know it's true it's true and i guess it's true and it, ba- it balances that fine line like you said of being kind of funny and scary when it comes to those sisters i think and either you're going to give yourself over to it or you're going to yeah. or you're going to laugh at it i think yeah. with some of those moments like you say when she has I a think, trance uh, it has come with age for me as yeah. in if i'm honest i remember when i first loved this film i did think that the section towards the end where he's on his own in Venice looking for Laura was a bit boring. Right. That is the truth. I say it. Yeah. And I'm ashamed that I thought that. (laughs) But the more I've watched it, the older I've got, I thought is, I don't think there's anything wrong with this film. But I remember thinking that was a bit boring because it's a, it's quite a slow section of, of what is essentially a man walking around Venice. Yes. But, once you're kind of locked into what's going on in his head, it's not boring. The bit I mean? that, yeah, I agree with you. And actually, the bit I struggle with the most is when he goes to talk to the guy. Is he a cop, a detective, yeah, or he works at the embassy, or whatever he is? So weird. What? What? Why is that scene there? Like, what? What is that? Because there's this character. They kind of the way they film him, the way he looks, and uh, the, I'm, I'm like, kind of like, is he supposed to be important in some way, or isn't he? You know. I think it's all part of this thing of. Uh, signs and not feeling and not being safe and he's gone to the authorities which is the police and they should make him feel safe Mm. but even they are very off kilter and eyeing him almost suspiciously and he's like he's almost saying why are you here what do you want and then he looks outside and he sees the two sisters that the man is talking about and Mm -hmm. he doesn't say anything yeah and there's this whole element of uh i guess who can you trust and also there's a way the way that he's shot in that police uh, room it's really wide and he's just on this sofa and he looks <laughs> yeah. like a little boy he's underneath some weird yeah. painting and stuff yeah and it's true like, it looks he's like just, he's in a headmaster's office yeah he's a lost off. little boy just yeah. like sort of going what the fuck is going on yeah and what is going on is you keep ignoring yeah what is right in front of you and what you saw and what you saw was the future and you you keep ignoring that you have this gift yeah you're so right because he, he has this gift but he doesn't really use it very well I like <laughs> you know he's that little bit too late when it you know when yeah. he gets the sign about his little girl at the beginning he's that little bit too late when he realises <laughs> who it is in the red coat at the end yeah. and all of these moments he's kind of he's not the best psychic <laughs> he doesn't know how to well he's it. just not trust. he's not trusting his gut is he he's trust not, your gut trust your gut exactly and I guess that's another thing about this film it's, it's kind of like abandoned logic and yeah. just what is the film telling you you know like yeah. oh shit something bad is happening kind of thing yeah. you also got these characters of these priests as well and yes. uh he's an interesting character as well there's that there's that moment when julie christie kind of kisses his ring yeah. kisses his hand and and he kind of goes you know are, are you a christian and there's there's the, there's this element of faith in it because the whole the whole film is is uh why i would uh com- relate it to david lynch and particularly to twin peaks mm. the return in mm. particular if you saw oh i did uh is i think And I think this is what I like in horror and why I like ghost stories more than other things. I guess I like the idea that there's more to the world than the world. Yes. And what ghost stories do and what Twin Peaks does and what this thing is like, there might be a lot. (laughs) There's a thin veneer between us and some other, whether it's another, you know, parallel universe or ghosts or whatever, life and death. And I think that the priests are... So yeah, representing uh, religion and faith, and he, the suggestions we get from the priest is that he, the way he is is either he he knows about like bad stuff, yeah, uh, or he hasn't had faith in a long time, but he sees something's going on. It's one of the two. There's something a bit exorcist about him. There is, there is. There's that moment at the end during the end montage when he sits up in yeah. his bed as well. So mm. it's like, oh, has he seen what's going on? Does he know? Do they have some sort of connection? Yeah, yeah. And it, it doesn't spell it out for you, but yeah, there's definitely something there. And I think that the wife is attached. The reason she kisses his ring is like because she's had this sort of uh, spiritual experience, and she's she's sort of going I'll, I'll take anything like is it religion should I be grateful to God I'm grateful to God you know yeah 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 and I guess the whole film is sort of going 
there's more yeah i can't tell you we can't put a name to it because yeah. it's it's much bigger than we can yeah it's so true take. we've talked about a few horror movies and types of horror movies uh zombie movies uh, uh, that, that have this kind of like real nihilism to them yeah. whereas ghost stories kind of have the opposite yeah. i think like you said there is a kind of hopefulness about them it's all the, the most beloved ghost movies like the Innocence and the Haunting of Hill House and the yeah. others and the Orphanage. These movies are like incredibly scary, but also really emotional. And they do yeah. have that element of hope and getting in touch with a loved, lost, you know, lost loved one or whatever. Um, it's really interesting, that's, and that's yeah, definitely that's there. Right. Yeah, that's right. They're not nihilist. These films. No, You're I don't right. think they are. As much as they terrify us, yeah. there's an element, obviously, and it's the same. Actually, we're going to be discussing sort of satanic movies and that kind of thing, things like The Exorcist. But I guess you know, movies like that that say that the devil is real, they also very much say God is real, right? Yeah. I mean, The Exorcist is the priests are the heroes. God wins out over the devil, and yeah. there there is also that kind of weirdly hopeful element to those types of movies too, that's as, true, as yeah. disturbing as they are. Um, there's definitely a bit of that. In, yeah, in Don't Look Now. Um, one thing I've got to ask you about as well, yeah. the music. So Pino DiNaggio's oh, yeah. score as well. What do love you think it. of that? There's a there's a European feel almost to this movie, I love think. It. There, there isn't. <laughs> love it. Love the music. Yeah. Like it's like a children's uh, uh, refrain, like almost like a child playing the piano. Yes. This kind of quite simple melody that... Yes often is unfinished in a scene mm-hmm. until I think it never is fully finished until the end when you have your big end montage and then it like all oh, fucking kicks off yeah 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 so it's this uh, there's something a little bit creepy about it and then it's yeah. also romantic and you're right there is a there is an element of child fairy tale music yeah. or something to it there's that moment when he finds that weird baby doll in the uh, on the side yeah. of the, the the lake the the, the river and uh, he there's that long there's that that beautiful music it reminded me a little bit i don't know how familiar you are with those kind of 70s giallo movies of like dario argento and suspiria and those types of movies i feel like they a lot of those Italian filmmakers must have been quite influenced by this movie. Films like Deep Red and those yeah, kind of movies yeah. definitely have a, a kind of connection there. Um, yeah, I think it's really beautiful music because, again, it doesn't, uh, maybe apart from the very end, it doesn't tell you what to feel in that kind of like Hitchcock psycho Absolutely sort of Absolutely right. That's right. It does not signal this bit's scary, this bit's no. no, it doesn't. You're right. It's doing something else, isn't it? And, of yeah. course, there's no music at all in the opening scene. It's just nothing, is there? Which That's is. Great. Yeah, <laughs> we're gonna watch it again after this. Um, have, I, have I mentioned? I think this feels good. It's pretty good, isn't it? Yeah. It's pretty good. It also has one of the scariest scenes I've ever seen involving a man falling off scaffolding. Yeah. Uh, like that, that scene terrifies me. <laughs> It's the kind of slow build-up of the th- the shard or whatever it is dropping. The yeah, the bit of wood. Plank of wood dropping yeah. through the glass and that build-up of you know what's coming, but it's still this kind of horrible dread and inevitability. Yeah, yeah it's pretty amazing. Please, please let him not go. <laughs> Let's talk about that incredible last cl- climactic moment then. It is one of the scariest things I've seen. Why? Yeah. What is happening in this scene, and why is it so scary? Well, well, it's a, it, a. It's doing the same thing as the first scene in terms of it suddenly starts cutting quite a lot. Yes, abruptly uh, between many things, and it's what it's doing is it, it seems like emotionally he has finally accepted something yeah. that he has been ignoring which is i am grieving and and maybe there is more to this realm mm. and he's been told he's now been sort of thoroughly proved by the fact that he's, he's got these sisters arrested he feels bad about everything he keeps seeing this red girl and then he's finally like maybe it is her mm-hmm. and so he's trying to get to her but the way that it's edited well you have the fucking scary sisters going don't let him not yeah, go that is horrible isn't it yeah really scary and then she's christine's running so she's trying to catch him so you know it don't sound good yeah yeah but he's now finally being sort of emotional and open and he's he's chasing this little red girl like let me help you let me help you hey 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 then go quick 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 la barca quick no 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 la barca espera me espera me and he, she's, he's being chased by the wife going, stop. And then there's this really, 
weird bit. He locks them in. He locks yeah. them in together because he uh, is now fully like, I'm, I'm here now for you, my daughter. Yes. I'm here now for you. Yeah. And then the wife really but it make, gives me shivers thinking of it she puts her hand through the gate and she says my darlings I won't hurt you come on darlings I mean fucking hell they're oh all at it god <laughs> it then, is so creepy and then he finally gets through this place that is literally like hell like there's smoke and right. fog all and, of a sudden we're in this like gothic castle yeah. or something yeah yeah and he goes upstairs and then she turns around and when he says, I, when she turns around, he goes, wait. And then she says, no. Oh. And he goes, wait. And she shakes her head, no. And then she goes, I mean, fuck. Wait, wait. It is. The, the, the look on her face yeah. as well. It's weird because it's not like she's angrily attacking him no. or violent or uh, aggressive it's just kind of smiling and sort of slowly coming towards God, him shaking her head give me chills yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i think what her face is saying is like you were fucking told right yeah you were fucking told there she's is, shaking her head like there's almost like a kind of smug look yeah, like yeah. you yeah we've given you every warning yeah. to get to this point you idiot yeah. kind of thing yeah this is all yours oh my god yeah. and then that moment when yeah. the kind of the knife the blade goes into the neck and that that it really loud jarring montage yeah. of kind of all of the weird stuff we've seen in the yeah. past <laughs> I guess kind of yeah upon repeat viewing it kind of brings everything perfectly to a close yeah. that, that that montage doesn't it it's uh and that she's the woman in this slide at the beginning and yeah uh, god it's a clever film did you know because again the film's so famous now for this moment had yeah. you seen that film had you seen that moment did you know the twist the first time no. you saw it no oh that's great that's the beauty of it for yeah, me, yeah i think i did but but also i'd only seen that scene in isolation so right. i kind of didn't really know where that was coming from or what that meant at the time but yeah. it's kind of that's the only problem with iconic movies like this right it's like the carry hand moment yeah. as well it's like unfortunately how do you how do you shield people from knowing that stuff yeah i don't it gets yeah to it? i i was very lucky not to have seen it i think i was just i don't i think i was going through a phase of like oh i want to watch yeah good films and yeah. i heard it was a classic and that was it i think yeah that's it you we'll go through that phase don't we where it's like right I'm going to start watching the good films yeah, now, yeah. the good stuff. Uh, one thing I, I I don't think I'd noticed until this time round, and I'm not entirely sure, is I always thought that the, in the very end, like at the funeral, mm. that the way that uh, Julie Christie looks, uh, as in her face, what she's doing with it, is almost... Uh, the way I always interpreted it, it was almost like at peace, like because at least she knows, because uh, she I think has accepted everything that he could not accept. Right. Yeah. And so, as sort of tragic as the ending is, she's going to be okay. That's sort of what I took from it. Yeah. The only bit I hadn't noticed until this time is that when they step off the boat, her and her son, the blind woman reaches for her, and she walks off. Yes, and she's left. Yeah, and yeah. then the the sister has to come back and get her. Yeah, and that upset me because I was like, oh, is she sort of has she no missed, just not noticed, or has she gone out? Oh, fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> to the to the blind. Yeah. That that feels very deliberate, right? Yeah, yeah. It really I don't lingers think there's on any that. Accidents, yeah. yeah, I know. I thought that as well. It's the first time I'd noticed it. I was like, yeah, oh, I don't poor. actually know what I, what. No. To, that's the only bit I don't have a firm answer. <laughs> what does it mean? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, do you think it's what forty-five years old? How has it aged? Has any of it dated for you? Not a day. <laughs> uh, only that people aren't on their mobiles the whole time. Yeah, yeah. That's it. Donald's uh, hair uh, and yeah, facial I hair, maybe. I was thinking that actually. I was thinking it's one of those films. It's the problem with horror films now, where when he thinks he's seen her on the boat, mm -hmm. if he had a mobile phone, he'd have called her. Yes, but. But I love she wouldn't have answered because she'd have been on the plane. I love that he can't. It's yeah. so much more isolated. And actually, it, you know, it's so funny. You see now 
every horror movie, every modern horror film will, will come up with a way in which people can't use their yeah, phones, yeah. whether it's the battery or the signal or they lose it or it has to, because that, that does, that writes off so much horror. Yeah. Like It's like, oh, they could just get on their phone at this point, you know. It writes off life as well. I do it think does. you used to be able to disappear. I don't yeah. think anyone can, I don't think you can go and like, I'm not that I want to do this, but like, you know. Just go and you find to yourself like, in yeah, Venice. Yeah, I want to go Brett. find myself <laughs> and, and go to the other side of the world and find myself. You'd yeah. be like, oh, fucking someone's vlogging me. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Not me, be, but yeah. then, you know what I mean? <laughs> no, it's so true. It's so true. Um, I think it does hold up really well. And did you see it in the 4K? Did you see yeah. the, the restored? Yeah. It looks good, right? Beautiful. It does look beautiful. beautiful. Really, really lovely. Um, amazing. Yeah. Uh, so that's pretty much it, Brett. Anything else you want to mention on Don't Look Now? Anything we haven't covered? Any stone yeah, it's we It's a didn't? load of shit. <laughs> yeah. uh, and what, anything we haven't said, let's have a little look. Oh, yeah, the one other bit that I thought is, is sort of, again, is like human behavior that is not movie behavior, mm. is that when the dad is pulling her out of the pond, the son is just watching and he's like, mm. he's like eating a lolly. He's doing something where he's sticking, it keeps sticking his finger in his mouth or something. Yes. Like he looks unbothered. Yes. But I think that, again, that's like, this is hum- This is how a child might react totally. to this rather than what a film child would do. Yeah, it's kind of confusion. He's just a bit confused rather Is he playing than... with a bit of glass or something? I think Something's he's happening, something yeah. Something in his hand. And at one point I thought his hand looked like it was bleeding. But yeah, it kind of is unclear. Yeah, yeah it's all very... Very creepy. That poor boy. I mean, at the yeah. end of it, I do end up feeling very sorry for the boy because it's like, oh, fair. that's his dad and his sister now. Yeah. He's been, he's still back at, you know, God yeah. knows where. Well, Brett, lastly, I just want to ask you a few quick questions that I ask every guest. Okay. Uh, first of all, you may have already answered this by the sounds of it, but what's your favourite horror movie? Uh, <laughs> scary <laughs> movie too. <laughs> it's Day Link now. Of course it is. Of course it is. Uh, what is the scariest movie you've ever seen? I do, I, do you know what? The, probably the answer is mm. is probably Twin Peaks Fire Walk With Me mm. because me and my sister, it took us a week to watch it because we were so scared we had to watch it in like 20 minute increments. Yeah. And uh, we kept, we hired it from a video shop. We kept having to take it back <laughs> and rehire it because we could only get through it. Yeah. I mean, that's a pretty fucking scary film. It is. Is there any particular moment in it or any scare, biggest scare? All of, I think it's fucking... And I think about this, and this can give me the fear <laughs> at night, is him just climbing in through our window when oh. she's in bed. I mean, my God. And him and him crouched down behind a chest of drawers oh, when she walks into her bedroom as well. Come off it. It's the way it's revealed. Yeah. Come off it. It's the way it's revealed. Absolutely yeah. horrific. Bob is the scariest person in all culture. Yeah, why? I mean, again, why is it? But yeah, you're so right. He absolutely is. Yeah. Um, did you like The Return, by the way? Did you like to love it. The Return? I love it so hard. It's so good, isn't it? So good. I mean, that is the ultimate, like, I can't believe it exists. I can't believe they gave him that freedom to make that unbelievable and i love i i I really admire i love him so much but i really love that the amount of people that must have that were that he made this thing and there was a lot of hype about it yeah but by episode four so many people were going what the fuck is this (laughs) it's what the fuck is going on it's so good because he he's never He's never just given you what you want on a no. plate. And it's like everyone expected this lovely 90s yeah. nostalgia trip of like cherry pies again. And and, and it's like, nope, of course that's not yeah. what you're going to get. Do you it want was... my big theory on, on why he's the best? Please. Oh, because all of this nostalgia stuff, mm. bring back Arrested Development, bring back all the things that we wanted to come back. And yeah. they all came back. And truthfully, and we don't like to say it, they weren't that satisfying when they came back. And the reason yeah. they weren't that satisfying is because they were exactly the same. Yeah. And you thought that's what you wanted. Yeah. But, you but don't. it turns out that the reason the thing you'd loved in the first place was you didn't know what you wanted. Yeah. And what he did with Twin Peaks, and I was so worried he wouldn't, is he went, I'm not going to give you no. Twin Peaks. No. Not the thing you thought you wanted. But if you remember when you first saw Twin Peaks, you couldn't believe your eyes because yeah. you'd never seen anything like this exactly. before. Exactly. So I'm going to fuck you up. <laughs> Twin Peaks has always been frustrating and yeah. weird and amazing and scary and confusing. And that's exactly what it was, just in a whole new way. That yeah. was what was brilliant about it. Uh, and I, I kind of think, I, I wasn't the biggest fan of Inland Empire. And I was like, oh, but I'm so glad. Yeah, I think I need to give it a, another watch, actually. Right, it's the it's one a, yeah, film of his that I struggle right. with a bit. But um, I'm now like, oh. Do you know, and I hope he carries on making more, but I'm like, if that's the last thing he ever yeah. does, that is like his, ama- an 18 hour David Lynch yeah. unfiltered movie. It was like his magnum opus. I loved it. So great. So good. Uh, Brett, thank you so much for joining oh, man, me. man, I'm sure this has been so boring and I apologize I've, to all your listeners. So, I've loved every second of it, yeah. as has everyone listening, I'm sure. Um, 
just tell us a little bit about you've got so many exciting things going on right now uh, what's the next sort of thing that you're currently working on that, or sort of next thing we could look uh, out for with you well i'm, I'm working uh, i'm currently working on t- three things i can't tell you about one of them but one of them uh uh, unless it all gets, you know, but currently, yeah, yeah, <laughs> let's yeah, say yeah, these all yeah. things end, yeah. get to the end. Uh, I'm making a six part anthology series for AMC, uh, which is about the w- a world where the soulmate test exists, where the hu- science has found proof of the human soul. And so now there is a test that matches you with your soulmate 100%. Oh, wow. And so each story is a different story set in the world where that test exists. Love it. Uh, and then, and that is a, that is basically, well, that's a drama so, with humour, but it's a, Brilliant. it's pretty drama. They're all kind of slightly different genres each episode. Oh, no, oh I'm all for, I love yeah. an anthology series. I'm yeah. so glad they're kind of starting to make a bit of a return, yeah. this kind of an anthology series. Bring them back. Love yeah, it. Bring them back. That's really exciting. So that's exciting. And, uh, and I'm also making a uh, Nan film, Na- Catherine Tate's Nan. Oh my God. And we've got J.C. Rourke directing it. J.C. Oh. Rourke who did Queen Mary, uh, Mary Queen of Scots. Yeah, goes, she's really... Not she's... the obvious choice for a Nan film, but no. she's fucking amazing. She it's is like, amazing. Surprisingly, we got J.C. Rourke. J.C. You know Rourke I mean? of the Donmar. Absolutely yeah. love J.C. Rourke. That's amazing. Oh my God. Yeah. So when can we expect that? Do you know? Uh, well, we're filming it shortly, I guess next year. I guess both of these things will be sometime next year. Oh, that's so exciting. And uh, and what about uh, films to be buried with? Anything? Films to be buried with. Oh, well, I'll be doing a live show at in at August 15th at the BFI. Uh, brilliant. Maybe I'll announce it on here with Roisin Connery. Ooh, oy, oy. Oh, uh, brilliant. So, so people can go get their tickets for that on the yeah, BFI that's available website. Now. Uh, and then I will just be carrying on. I've got some very good guests in the can. Whoa, exciting. Uh, January Jones. Yes. She's in the can. Oh my God. Uh, did, you, did you like sort of bag a load of people in LA when yeah, you were out in LA? Great. Yeah. Love so it. there's a lot, there's a lot in the bank. Brett, thank you so much for joining thank me. Thank you. What a pleasure. Thanks, man. And that's it for this week. Thank you so much for listening and a big thank you to my brilliant guest, Brett Goldstein. Such a treat and an honor to have him on the podcast. So, what did you think of this week's episode? And what do you think of Don't Look Now? Do you agree that it's one of the all-time classics of the genre? Or is it a bit overrated? Uh, Get in touch. The email address is evolutionofhorror at gmail.com. You can find us on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, and on Letterboxd. Don't forget, we've got a competition. If you spotted what Brett mentioned as his scariest scene in his scariest movie, then write in to evolutionofhorror at gmail.com, and you'll be entered into a competition to win a Don't Look Now prize. Uh, And one more time, if you want to support the podcast, sign up to our Patreon channel and get weekly new episodes over the summer while we're in a a little hiatus, then please sign up now. Go to patreon.com slash evolution of horror. You can find four previous series of the podcast, a whole series on zombie movies, on folk horror, on ghost movies, and on slasher movies. Uh, Simply go to evolutionofhorror.com and you can find every single previous episode on the podcast right there. And you can subscribe to this podcast on all major podcast platforms, including iTunes, Podbean, Stitcher, Acast, and various others. If you get a chance, please do subscribe to us, leave us a little rating or review if you can. It's a huge help, especially right now while we're not churning out kind of tons of new content. It keeps us on people's radars and helps us get discovered by new listeners. So that's it for now. Join us in the autumn for a brand new series on the occult in horror. And until then, keep an eye out. You never know, there may be another couple of bonus episodes popping up here and there over the summer. Thanks for listening and join us again very soon for all of this and more on the evolution of horror. (laughs) 